program contains graphic scenes and language which may be inappropriate for all family members. Viewer discretion is suggested. They're coming for you. Voracious zombies slowly stalk their prey. You can't escape. <laughs> Creatures have an insatiable appetite for human flesh. Sink your teeth into the incredibly strange film show with George Romero as an unearthly realm of terror awaits on ghosts, ghouls, and goblins. City Cemetery, located about 30 miles outside of Pittsburgh. And it was here in 1968 that the opening scenes of a low-budget black-and-white horror film were shot, a movie that has since become a modern classic and has had an influence on every major horror film made since then. All the more remarkable, then, that the film was the first feature to be produced by a small local advertising group. The film was The Night of the Living Dead, and the director, cinematographer, editor and co-author was George A. Romero. We're up to bring this to you. This is the latest disclosure in a report from National Civil Defense Headquarters in Washington. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. A widespread investigation of reports from funeral homes, morgues, and hospitals has concluded that the unburied dead are coming back to life and seeking human victims. It's hard for us here to believe what we're reporting to you, but it does seem to be a fact. Night of the Living Dead has all the ingredients of a corny B-movie, but it's now generally regarded as the most groundbreaking horror film ever. For the first time, the public were treated to graphically realistic scenes such as this. There was no MPAA at that point, there was no ratings board at that point, so there was no uh, panel of, of uh, experts that were that were issuing dictates or reviewing films and saying, well, you can leave this in, but you have to take that out. But there was this unwritten uh, law which came from, you know, over the course of years, you have to sort of stand back and be polite and just show the shadow and not show the knife entering flesh. And um, <clears throat> I, I just didn't see, I didn't, I didn't know why. And, you know, I guess from having been weaned on EC comic books and things like that, I said, well, why can't we do that? And why hasn't anyone done it? it you know, I didn't think so much that we were breaking uh, down barriers as, as uh, you know, probably my first thought was, well, why didn't anyone ever do it this way? The film was financed and produced by Image 10, a small Pittsburgh company that George founded with several friends. Their only previous experience had been local television commercials like this one. For a natural man, and I take my pleasure, natural as I can. Well, there ain't no pleasure like a natural brew. Tall and cold, and Duke is a natural beer for the natural man. George and I were we're having lunch at uh, Sam Rini's bar, a bar similar to this diner, and uh, which is out of business now. And uh, we were kind of discouraged about doing commercials and the fickleness of the clients. And, and I said, what if we got 
10 of us together, just, you know, 10 friends and, and, the, and the people that we work with every day, and everybody kicked in 600 bucks, and uh, we'd have $6,000. Could we do any kind of black and white movie on that? You know, we should be able to do something, especially if we made a horror movie, we should be able to do something better than these, these creatures in rubber masks or, or giant spiders or whatever. So George got all excited, and he said, uh, we're going to make a movie, bam. <laughs> he hit the tabletop, and all the bottles and the ashtrays jumped, and all the patrons stared at us, and, and, uh, and that was it. We were going to make a movie. We did. We, we put together 6,000 bucks and got started. The film examines the plight of a group of people who have taken refuge in a farmhouse as the bizarre phenomenon of the living dead begins. Shot in grainy black and white and with extensive use of handheld camera, it has a documentary feel to it that adds to the terror, with many critics interpreting its style and bleak tone as a critique of late 1960s America. Uh, I think it just came from the anger of the times. Um, it, it was 1968, and, and nobody was in a very gleeful mood about the way the world was going, and so it just seemed appropriate to put those themes in, into the film as well. The most potent image in the film is Romero's realistic, slow-moving zombie. Zombies were all friends of ours and people from, we, we were, I, uh, we had a film company, uh, myself and some of the other guys that were involved had a film company, we were doing commercials and, and uh, industrial films here in town. And there were, so there were a lot of people from the, the ad game that all wanted to come out and be zombies and, um, and, and a lot of them did and they were all just friends of ours and people, and some people from around Evan City who just thought it was a goof and came out to get caked with makeup and lumber around. I played Helen Cooper, the uh, lady in the basement, and also a ghoul, <laughs> one of the ghouls who eats the insect on the tree. We were short of ghouls that day. I was uh, Harry Cooper, the one who uh, said it was a lot safer in the basement because there were a million weak spots up here on the first floor. <laughs> And he and was right. As it turned out, I was right, yeah. <laughs> Look, you two can do whatever you like. I'm going back down to the cellar, and you better decide. Because I'm going to board up that door, and I'm not going to unlock it again, no matter what happens. You box yourself in the cellar, and those things get in the house, you've had it. At least up here, you have a fighting chance. Yeah, it looks like about eight or ten out there now. There's more than there were. There are a lot out back, too. Night of the Living Dead premiered here in Pittsburgh on October the 2nd, 1968. And from day one, it was met with outrage and controversy. Perhaps the least flattering review appeared in Variety magazine, which described the film as an unrelieved orgy of sadism and amateurism of the First Order. Despite, or perhaps even because of such reviews, the movie was a massive hit on the drive-in circuit, its audience growing steadily as its reputation for unmitigating horror spread by word of mouth. At the moment we tried to get distribution, everyone tried to convince us to take out a lot of material change. The ending and the usual, you know, the expected things that from distributors, that the, the kind of, of complaints that you get from people that, are, that want to distribute a movie for the purposes of making money. Uh, <clears throat> But we stuck to it, and we finally got a distributor who ripped us off but showed the movie. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether to complain or to be um, thankful. Uh, uh, you know, I, I have never really... There's all this sort of myth and legend that's risen about how much we were ripped off. And, uh, and God, God knows, I don't, I don't... I haven't been able to figure it out, but, uh, you know, there are several of us that have gotten careers out of it, and it's been a very lucky thing. So I never sort of look back and complain about the way we, we were treated, because the film got a pretty fair shake. Probably 
the most groundbreaking and influential aspect of the movie is its ironic and unhappy ending. Everyone dies. I asked Romero how he felt today about the new realism he brought to screen violence. When On the Waterfront came out, everyone was in shock because uh, he told the priest to go to hell, you know. And um, I just thought that, in retrospect, gradually, that while we were sort of just one more indication of time moving on, and that, you know, couldn't wait for them. Remember when they started to say shit, and then couldn't wait for the day when you could say... And, uh, you know, I, just because it all seems so silly to me that I... Why not, you know? Do you, think, do you think that kind of progress is always a good thing? Because now the, the kind of trend which, to an extent, you started by showing people eating things and you showing the gore has now got to the stage where often the films have very little content as opposed to that. I don't think that's the reason, though. No. I mean, of course, that I think that always happens. I mean, when something, when, when a door first opens, you get this flood of, of uh, people that misuse and abuse things. Uh, uh, you know, but the door has to be opened or else you'll never be able to use it properly. Romero followed Night of the Living Dead with three films. There's always Vanilla, Jack's Wife and The Crazies, all of which were flops at the box office. So to help pay back the debt he now found himself in, Romero directed a series of sports documentaries for television while he developed the right project with which to return to the big screen. Set, as always, in one of the suburbs of Pittsburgh. This is the small town of Braddock, Pennsylvania, where the once thriving steel mills that provided employment for most of the population are now shut down. It's almost as if the life has been sucked out of the local community, which made it an especially appropriate location for Romero's next foray into the world of low-budget horror. Martin, made in 1976, tells a story of a young man who might or might not be a vampire. Nosferatu. Reside ergo in nomine patris et filio spiritu et santi. Vampire. First, I will save your soul. Then, I will destroy you. Tony Buba, who, whose house this belongs to and his family, his grandmother lives in this house, and we shot a great portion of, of Martin here in this house. And we were in the third floor attic where Martin slept. And uh, she was quite, quite concerned that she wa we had, I, we had a fondness for one another. And uh, she was quite concerned and wasn't at all too sure exactly what they were doing to me up there. And she had good reason to be worried, as Martin marked the first collaboration between Romero and the most sought-after special effects man in the business, fellow Pittsburghian Tom Savini. This guy started out as a normal person. He reaches up and through some mystical Egyptian curse, he melts down. We had smoke and bubbles coming out, his eyes exploded, he screams in pain. The real actor was below with his real hands doing all this when he fell apart. You know. This is what's left of him. And he, again, he has all this congealed blood, so he's a little sticky right now. Where do you, where do you keep these things? Do you have any of this stuff at home? Oh, these are all in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter plays with Lizzie. My daughter's about as tall as Lizzie, and she plays with her occasionally. What does your wife think about all this? You know, my wife is not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> She'd rather have a normal bedroom, I think. That first read you get on him is absolutely true. I mean, he's just, he's so energetic and so responsive and so um, in love with the work that, that uh, it's very hard to deny Tom, you know. He, and, um, and we found that we could work together comfortably and, and, and real, truly uh, collaborate. And, uh, and uh, I, I haven't made a film without Tom on the set now for it since then, uh, in one capacity or another. Martin was the first time I had to think of how to fool people into believing what they were actually seeing uh, was happening. Uh, the stake in the neck, George said, uh, well, look, we'll just get a, a, go to a, a slaughterhouse and get a, a sheep or a lamb or something and, do a close-up of the stake going in there. And I remember saying, no, 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 we can do it so you actually see the guy's face and the stake going in his neck. He says, well, how? I said, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And that's what I mean, that was the first time I had to think of, of the illusion of special makeup effects. You weren't supposed to be there. You weren't supposed to be there. But 
despite his behaviour, the film manages to remain deliberately vague as to whether or not Martin is really a vampire. That's always been left a little ambiguous. I, I, I think it's kind of interesting uh, uh, for people to see it and um, maybe make a choice for themselves. Uh, he was certainly uh, uh, psychologically uh, disturbed. <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't know whether I want to make a statement as to whether he is or, or isn't. I think it's better left, I think it's better left uh, up in the air. I warned you, Martin. Nobody in the town, I said. Nobody in the town. I heard about Mrs. Santini. Do you think I believe she killed herself? Do you really think I believe this? Your soul is that, North Fernando. return to the zombies with which he made his name in 1978, ten years after their first appearance, in the bigger, bolder and bloodier Dawn of the Dead. The posters for Dawn of the Dead exclaimed when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Maybe they should have read, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will go shopping, because this is where most of the movie takes place, and the massive Monroeville shopping mall a few miles from downtown Pittsburgh. In the movie, a handful of humans hide out in the storerooms above these shops, while the living dead wander aimlessly around below them, stumbling on the escalators and dragging now useless consumer appliances behind them. was hell. I mean, we couldn't get in there until all the shops were closed, which are uh, not only closed, but cleaned up. And so that meant 10 or 11 at night. And then there was a tavern and a restaurant and a, and a sort of a, a, a disco, a little disco that was open until uh, I think two in the morning, the last place. And we couldn't, you know, we couldn't shoot sound until after that. For some reason, some society of senior citizens would show up at the mall at like uh, six o'clock in the morning uh, for exercise. They would just walk around the mall. So there was this one corner where about 35 senior citizens were walking toward the corner and about 300 hideous zombies, and they met. <laughs> there were no fatalities, uh, fortunately. It's in Dawn of the Dead that the team of Savini and Romero really came into their own. Although it's more of an action-adventure shocker than a straightforward horror film, Romero takes the story of the zombies one logical step further. As society slowly collapses, four of the few surviving humans seek refuge in this vast mall, constantly on guard against the hordes of living dead, just waiting for a chance to eat them. Most of them were assembly line zombies. We would make generic appliances, small, medium and large, and if you fit that particular uh, size, that's the zombie that you would be. These creatures cannot be considered human. They prey on humans. They do not prey on each other. That's the difference. They attack and they feed only on warm flesh. Uh, intelligence, seemingly little or no reasoning power, but basic skills remain a more remembered behaviors from uh, normal life. Some zombies were just people who looked like they were fresh from a funeral parlor, made up real pretty like a mortician would do, and he walked around in a nice business suit. And, you know, so, yes, we did try to think of uh, making them look like people who had died in great ways, you know, great ways, yeah. How do you die in a great way? Interestingly, visceral, gory ways, you know. When I'm 
writing a script, I'll talk to Tom and I'll say, hey, you know, have you dreamed up anything in the last few weeks that you really want to try? And I'll write it in. Uh, that kind of stuff, you know. We just have this sort of uh, giggly time uh, dreaming stuff up together. A person listening to our conversations, it would have been incredible, you know. But for us, it's something that we do every day. I mean, and look around you, there's severed heads, there's people with their faces melted up. And for us, it's an art. It's a, you know, there's a lot of sculpture involved. But most people, when they see the film, they just see gore. They just click into the gore and they don't realize how much sculpture and mechanics, photography and mechanisms and chemistry goes into it. it just like it the way people like roller coaster rides and if you like it and if you're a fan of it you can't get enough of it and you want to see it well executed and tom is one of those guys that is executing it well and so i think that's why people are you know in love with the films i mean he has his own fans that will go see a tom savini film you know not caring about who the director is or who the writer is or who any of the other people are. um and i you know that's the group I haven't examined it to find out whether there's a real sociological reason, but I've always just sort of thought of it something that's sort of come up with rock and roll and with punk and with this uh, attitude of let's, you know, sort of fart on the establishment or something. And it's always been part of that subculture. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I, I don't think of it quite as, irreverent, as irreverently as some of those things. But to me, it's, it's part of, it's Grand Guignol. You know, it's, it's, there's always been... A, a part of some people's minds, I think, that are sort of tuned into it, you know. Jim will fix it. I've decided to exploit my position on this program in order to fulfill a boyhood ambition. Tom Savini has graciously agreed to make me up as a zombie. Tom, where do we begin? Well, let's begin by slapping this little bit on the face here. Lovely. Got some adhesive in there. And we'll just position it. You're all done. See you later. Okay, Tom, thanks a lot. Okay, now we'll just continue. I haven't worn one of these for weeks. process was neither as painful nor time consuming as I'd expected, taking only about 20 minutes. And there you have it, a remarkable improvement even if I do say so myself. I know you, you served in Vietnam for a while. Mm -hmm. Did that have any effect on, on the work you do now? Is that any influence in any way? Um, I get asked that question a lot. Um, in fact, one, one magazine said that my whole uh, uh, is, is, is based on my experiences in Vietnam, and that's not true. I was interested in makeup, as you know, from the age of 12. I did see a lot of firsthand anatomically correct gore, you know, and I think the most important part of that was if we have to create a dead body or create a, 
a situation, there's a certain feeling you get from seeing the real thing that can't be achieved. I mean, you can, one guy can make a fake head or a fake body and position it somehow. But there's something about uh, what I saw, uh, the, the cadaver. For example, you ever see a movie where someone's about to die and they're talking and they're, they got their last cigarette and someone's holding their mouth and, you know, they're, they're all screwed up, you know, and they're about to die. And then when they die, they, they turn their head and close their mouth and achieve this peaceful countenance, you know. You know, you, you relax, your jaw hangs slack, you might even drool, you know. That's, from seeing the real stuff, you know, that's what makes it different. You know, there's a certain body positioning. I mean, someone might die with one eye open and a smile on their face, you know. And, uh, or someone might die in this frozen, scared position, you know. You don't just close your mouth and achieve this angelic appearance, you know. So I think, having seen the real thing, if, if I'm creating a gory effect and it doesn't give me the same feeling that I felt when I saw the real stuff, I'm not satisfied. Throughout his career, Romero has worked almost exclusively here in Pittsburgh, and like all regional filmmakers, his chosen town has heavily influenced his work. There's always been a sort of an ethic and a reality to the place. I mean, people don't lie about much here. You know, it's the things are the way they are. And it's, it's just part of that. It's a part of the American heartland that's, I guess, similar to the farmland. Only it's the other side of, of uh, you know, it's the other side of commerce. It's that industrial strength that this country used to have, a thing of the past. But uh, it's still reflected in the muscle of, the, of the, the kind of people, I think, that live in places like this. The final film in the Dead Trilogy was initially intended to be an epic. It was going to be the Gone with the Wind of zombie films. George wanted to take the story of the undead about as far as he possibly could. But to raise the money needed to make a film of that scope, he would have had to cut back on the gore and violence, something he wasn't prepared to do. Instead, he pared down the script and made a much smaller, more economical film. But even so, to my mind, The Day of the Dead is still the most gruesome, visceral and intense of all three films. one of not necessarily the last but but one of, of probably several nests of humanity that are left it was a military group they were there for research um, and of course now the need for what they're doing is is all but gone because with society gone you know who are they going to report to if they find anything out and all of a sudden when the, that structure is gone they don't quite know how to behave or they cling to old behaviors and no one talks to each other and nobody communicates and there's this sort of tragedy about the, uh, the lack of, of human communication causing chaos and causing uh, a general a collapse of, of even this small um, uh, little pie slice of, of, of society. <laughs> George's films always avoid the stereotypes and cliches of Hollywood. In Day of the Dead, by far the strongest character is a woman, played by Laurie Cardile. You know, he could have made me this uh, sexy little twit, not bouncing around with a gun and, you know, much more... Um, the sexual element and uh but he made her intelligent and and strong and in fact whenever i would
try to make her a little more uh, emotional. He would, he would not, uh, he would just not do, not allow me to do that. What happened to this one? It was too unruly. I couldn't handle it. I had to destroy it. We can still get information from it. Dr. Logan, we are losing the cooperation of the men. I'm not even sure they'll go up top when we run out of the specimens we already have. I'm not sure they won't just try to shut us down completely. I'll show them results. I'll show them results. I'll show them that these creatures can be domesticated even without the surgery. Knowing what they are, we can begin to approach them properly, condition them, control them. You've got to do this, sir. It's our only hope. Yes, this is Major Cooper. Jesus, God, Logan. Do you know what they'll do to you if they find out about this? Do you know what they'll do to all of us? They'll never find out. They can't be recognized. With a couple of exceptions, the zombies are more likable than most of the humans, most of the living humans in, in, uh, in, uh, in Day of the Dead. In the Dead, yeah. There's, there's not too many people in Day of the Dead that, you can, <laughs> that you'd want to bring home. But, um, <clears throat> well, I have, I've always uh, had a soft spot in my heart for the zombies. I mean, they really don't do anything intentionally wrong. In fact, the friendliest character in Day of the Dead is a zombie, the almost lovable Bub. I've always been sympathetic towards them, I think. I think I've, I, I think I've always treated them sympathetically, even the ones that are, you know, that get the humans and the, uh, the protagonists in, in the most dire uh, situations. I, I, never, I never make them out to be just utter, just monsters. It's not only the last of the zombie films, but also the goriest, with Savini and Romero really pulling out all the stops. a guy in half and we filled his fake body with uh, intestines and chicken parts and things like that and he was trapped underneath the floor so that we could attach this body to him now he was trapped and unfortunately the entrails that we had in our refrigerator uh someone unplugged the refrigerator two weeks before this and they were rank i mean they were really awful so the zombies in the scene had their noses stuffed with wax so they couldn't smell it but this poor guy trapped in the floor uh, he was ready to throw up when it was over. It was, the smell was incredible. So will this be the last George Miller zombie picture and zombie fans look for them all after this one? I don't know. As I say, I have an idea now, which I'd really love to do. If I can work out the sort of legal way to do it, I'll probably do it. I'd love to do it. I'd love to, you know, I don't want to... I'd love to do another zombie country. So you're not sick of zombies yet? No, I'm not. I'll never get sick of the zombies. <laughs> I just get sick of producers. <laughs> <laughs> but although George seems to have kicked the zombie habit, Tom Savini certainly hasn't given them up. He's currently planning to remake the original Night of the Living Dead. The original film is over in about 50 minutes and then it continues on. So the remake will be a remake and plus a little bit of a sequel, you know, to, to the original film. It'll be in color, of course. Um, we have to invent a, a new way to portray the, the zombies. In Night of the Living Dead, it's the birth of the dead, birth of the zombies. So it's not quite as elaborate and far gone as, say, Day of the Dead. 
So, I mean, it, there's a whole lot of things we have to work out for that film, but I think it'll be a, a ballsy, exciting remake. <laughs> As for George, he's just finished a thriller called Monkey Shines and is currently working on an adaptation of a story by Edgar Allan Poe. But despite his reputation, I asked him if he found it frustrating to be known only as a director of horror films. Now, I wish that people wouldn't use pigeonholes, but they do. And so um, it's sometimes disturbing to me when there's something, particularly when there's something that I really like or a script that I really like or a novel that I really like and try to get, try to go after. And, and when someone says, well, gee, that's not your kind of thing, is it? Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. When you, when you, when you want to do something like make movies, you just want to make movies. You, know? you don't grow up saying, gee, I want to make war movies or I want to make jungle movies or, you know, I just want to make movies. And, I, I, and uh, I, I'm sure that there is, uh, um, and I'm sure that, that certain filmmakers, and probably myself included, have a certain kind of an affinity or more talent for one thing than another. But uh, it's disturbing that you don't, because it's such an expensive medium, you just don't get a chance to, to try your hand at things. And so that's bothersome. On the other hand, it's given me a great career and a comfortable life and everything else. And so I can't really complain about it in that sense. And I do love it. I love the genre. So I don't, it's cool. 